Today, I'm going to be talking about software for vector synthesis and performance. Uh, what I'm planning to do is mostly show examples from video, because that is pretty much guaranteed to work. And then, depending on the time we've got left at the end, I'll hopefully show a few examples of the performance software I'm using in pure data. And that's 95% guaranteed to work, but I think I'll leave that to the end for that reason. Uh, so, a uh, little bit about me, Douglas Dunn. I am, as of Monday, part of the School of Cre Cambridge School of Creative Industries at Anglia Ruskin in Cambridge. It's quite a long story. We've moved department and moved faculty and moved school and moved just about everything over the time that I've been here. And in fact, until last Friday, I was in the science faculty. We've just moved into the arts faculty. Um, now, I don't really need to tell everybody who's here why we're talking about vector graphics, but I thought I would anyway, just to give, if you like, my perspective on this very much growing field. Um, obviously, just about everybody working with graphics is working with raster graphics um, in all fields of computer graphics, so games, video, animation, and art. Why are we using vector graphics? Well, this, is this idea of infinite resolution, of course, that's not quite true. But the idea that we don't get any pixelation in what we're seeing until it gets to the camera or the projector. Before then, there's no, uh, there's no pixelation involved. It's got this line-based aesthetic, so it's very much similar in some ways to uh, drawing with pen and ink. And we can say that since anything you draw on a vector monitor disappears in about a tenth to a fifth of a second, it's like drawing in uh, disappearing ink because of, of course, the persistence of the phosphor. Uh, other things that uh, people in the field have mentioned is the idea that we're using old hardware, analog scopes and Vectrex monitor and so on, and keeping them off the scrap heap. And that, I suppose, is an environmental consideration. Somebody otherwise would have to dispose of all the CRTs, and we're there saying, no, we want them, we want to reuse them. Uh, for some people, it's re-implementing old devices like the Rotetra scan processor or the ScanMate. I'm not going to be talking about that because other people here have talked about that and will be talking about that in much more detail later. Uh, another thing that uh, is of personal interest and probably to many viewers as well is doing something different to what everybody else does. Everybody else is working with raster graphics, using standard tools, the Adobe Creative Suite for studio work, using Resolume or similar video samplers when it comes to VJ work, when it comes to live performance. Other packages are available, of course, they are amongst the leaders. And I suppose a working hypothesis is that when vector displays went out of use, Asteroids was one of the most advanced computer games available. We just simply didn't have the computer power to do anything much more uh, interesting than uh, uh, what's shown up there. And of course, now that computers have taken off that we can make the most of these types of displays, perhaps one, that's one of the reasons why vector graphics is making a little bit of a comeback. Uh, Cliff mentioned the font that I'd used. This is an emulation of the Hershey vector font that came out in uh, 67. You'll still find this in use in plotting uh, devices and engraving machines, of course, they have to use a vector font. But just for reasons of sanity, I'll go to a more traditional font. This is still, I suppose, technically a vector font, that these are made up with curves and lines. Uh, you can see, of course, they I've picked very curly characters to demonstrate the, the clear differences between these. Um, Again, something that probably many of you have uh, been thinking about, why are we using audio tools for something that's not audio? Um, one of the attractions, of course, is if you've got an audio tool, you don't have to just restrict it to producing the, uh, the video. You can use it for generating audio synchronized with exactly the same tool. You've got the same need for controlling lots of parameters in a very, uh, a very intimate, a very uh, time-dependent manner, and audio tools are, of course, good for that. And then there's the idea that, as many of us have discovered, 
there's a lot of things that we need to do in the vector domain that correspond directly to something that can be done easily uh, in the audio domain. So a very simple example, uh, drawing a circle as has been discussed, you need to generate a cosine and a sine wave. If you want that to be an ellipse, you change the horizontal gain. If you want it to grow in size, if you want it to move to a different position, of course, a random DC offset will do that. Uh, if you want it to grow repeatedly, then a sawtooth LFO will take care of that. If you want the brightness to fade, then the third channel has got a down-going sawtooth LFO. And if you want several of those objects, then you simply multiplex between several objects doing the same thing, which leads to uh, hopefully the first uh, example. Hopefully. Nope, not that example. So this is one of the first uh, first vector experiments I did. Raindrops keep falling on my Hamag HM204, demonstrating, of course, all the same uh, the same techniques that were mentioned uh, mentioned a second ago. There's a few artifacts in this. Obviously, there's not. I hadn't blocked the light, so you see the reflection. We've got the graticule. And there's also an artifact that's more visible at this side, that it's not actually going to the edge of the screen. And I spent quite a long time swearing at pure data, trying to work out where the bug in the software was. Uh, and then I realized that my oscilloscope was dying, and the horizontal deflection was starting to give up. And about a week after this, the horizontal deflection coil just gave up completely, and now I've got a scope that's great for vertical lines and nothing else. It happens. Um, display devices, this is, a, of course, a, a crucial aspect. We've got to somehow get these vectors onto a screen, and this sort of just summarizes what, again, many of you will have found. Cheap and easy option is an analog oscilloscope, as long as we've got brightness control. Uh, arcade monitors very expensive, very hard to find, and they do require uh, a bit of modding, and you can't carry them from one place to another. Uh, Vectrex console is the main one that I use. You'll have seen that talked about uh, and just demonstrated in other talks. Uh, other possibilities, the same type of mod that uh, Fred Konopaska, as was mentioned uh, yesterday, has been doing for cathode ray tube uh, TVs. It's a little bit more expensive, but it can be done. It requires rewinding the, uh, rewinding the coils and the, uh, the deflection coils. Other possibilities, I'm not going to say much about uh, the oscilloscope emulator because, again, uh, we'll hear, you'll hear that mentioned in other talks. Stroke to raster converter, again, you might have noticed that upstairs. I can't say much about it because I've not used it myself, and laser projectors. We're going to be looking at lots of lasers today. So again, I'm not going to uh, mention that. But this sort of, for me, sums up the options. Uh, Vectrex, we don't need to say. The an annoying thing that Derek mentioned yesterday, the spot killer circuit that is there to protect the CRT, this ends up being quite an annoyance when using it for vector graphics, because it means that every now and again, what you've got to stop what you're doing and draw a very fast, uh, invisible, uh, horizontal line. And that's what stops the spot killer from working. Either that, or you do a very s small modification, as Derek has, uh, uh, has talked about. Uh, and then the capture system, high definition camera is great. Uh, other options are available. Uh, some people use uh, phone cameras for that uh, that part of it. The danger of death is from Andrew Duff's uh, modification guide. Um, as in fact, I think this Vectrex might be. Is that one your? Is that Vectrex yours, Andrew? Ah. Uh, 
Okay, right. I'm not, in that case, I'm not sure who's that, who's won that. Uh, Vectrex seems to be a, a popular choice because, of course, you don't have the grass cool. You get a nice crisp display uh, with a sort of fairly minor modification to the uh, to the insides. Uh, now this setup is is yours. The uh, uh, the option of doing things in hardware, and of course there's a a sort of debate had been has been had, and the same debate applies to sound synthesis just as it does to uh, to vector synthesis. Great advantages that you can have a very uh, very configurable signal path. You can reconfigure the signal path very simply just by plugging and unplugging the uh, patch cables, and most importantly, you've got a huge number of controls available to you, which for me is one of the downsides of doing this in software. Uh, disadvantages, you can't say, right, I like this, I'm going to save the patch. The best you could possibly do is maybe take a photograph of the user interface and try to recreate that. And also a common problem with modular hardware is what Germans refer to as cable salad. All this spaghetti of cables that are making it harder to get at the uh, at the controls. Um, software again, I've got it's got its pros and cons. Some things it can do uh, that are very difficult, if not impossible, in hardware. You can save your setup, and also you can do non-real-time rendering, and that's something I find myself doing quite a lot if I'm pushing the limits of the processor, I can just say I'll record all of my outputs and then I can play that back entirely separately and make sure that there's no, uh, there's no glitches as a result. But of course, with software, you're limited unless you have hardware controllers to, uh, to actually control the patch in. And hardware doesn't crash. Software has got quite a habit of doing that. I'm mainly going to be talking about these top two programs, Pure Data or Per Data, and Chuck, text-based language and a graphical programming environment. But there's others that I'll mention in passing, but again, because other colleagues are going to be talking about them at this event, uh, I won't really say much about uh, the We Were Here uh, program for Max MSP that Cliff does. Uh, Oski Studio, which uh, Hansi and uh, Jerabim are using, and possibility of going, well, not quite between software and hardware, but having a hardware emulation of, a software emulation of uh, a modular hardware rack in the form of VCV rack, which has gathered quite a lot of interest recently. I haven't seen it being used much in the vector synthesis field, although it does seem ripe for uh, exploration. Uh, Andrew will know exactly what this is referring to. At the, uh, the Bath Spa conference, Seeing Sound last, uh, last March, in fact, Andrew had this slide at the very end of his, uh, uh, his presentation, and he was setting up for my punchline in the form of the, uh, uh, the left-hand slide. But, um, I think, I think we agreed that there was really no argument to be had between software and hardware. Both of them are very good at some parts of what we want to do. Uh, and in the same way that when choosing software, you'd pick the most appropriate program for uh, a task, the same thing would go for hardware. There's some effects that are much simpler in hardware, and it's much more feasible to do in hardware than the, uh, the software equivalent. And as well as that uh, aspect, nothing is stopping us from using both. This is uh, Derek's performance from uh, Bath Spa. He talked about the Benjolin, which is that uh, central unit, but he's also uh, one of the people using uh, pure data. So we use the most appropriate tool. Same way in music, if you want a semi-brief, you don't use a xylophone. If you want a particular type of music, if you're writing classical music, you're not going to do it in Fruity Loops. If you're writing for string quartet, uh, then Ableton Live is not really the most appropriate thing. However, if you're writing four-on-the-floor dance music, you're not going to use Sibelius. 
all of these software packages have got things that they're very good at and things that they can't do very well. So I'll touch on some of those perhaps in this, uh, this talk. Uh, another idea is of maybe not totally developed, but this idea that we've got different degrees of relationship between the video and the audio. Now, the example that some of you might have heard just before I started uh, was using uh, somebody else's CD. And it was sort of like acting as a VJ uh, and uh, trying to interpret it and using, using it sort of as an, an inspiration, as a background to the visuals. And it was, in, in some cases, interpreting the audio directly using a, a oscilloscope-type display or things related to that. And I'll come back to that shortly. Uh, we can have a more literal display, and in the uh, performance last night from uh, Jeremy Manhansi, you had an example where what you see is what you hear, that we're sending exactly the same signals to the loudspeakers and the vector display device. And we can choose any of these different methods, and we can even switch between them quite freely, depending on the uh, methodol methodology that we're using. So again, with such a wide variety of people in different ways that people are performing, we're all free to choose whichever of these we think is the most appropriate at a time. Uh, so of the software I'm going to be mentioning, uh, we can sort of draw almost a line between stuff that we're going to use in the studio and some stuff that we're going to use in a live situation. It doesn't have to be a boundary, but uh, that's one thing that we usually need to consider. Of course, we need something that's multi-channel, and that rules out a lot of software packages that just aren't designed for uh, three or more channels. Uh, it's nice if software is free and open source. Again, it's not strictly a requirement, but uh, we all like to not spend money or spend our money on other things. Uh, open source, again, is not essential, but we've heard from several other people saying reasons why, why this is a, a, a good aspect to look for in any, uh, any package. Uh, of the different packages, we've got some that are graphical or data flow, as they're sometimes referred to. Like, uh, like pure data, uh, some that are more text-based. Again, we don't necessarily have to make a decision. The two pieces of software I'll be talking about, pure data and Chuck, uh, I use both of them in teaching uh, music technology, and I find that some people simply prefer the graphical programming environment, and some people prefer the text-based environment, especially if they're more used to uh, a language such as C or C++, Java, MATLAB, and, uh, and so on. Again, we don't necessarily have to make the decision until we've got a particular goal in mind, and then we can decide on what will achieve this task in the, uh, in the most efficient manner, or the manner that simply requires the smallest amount of coding. Uh, Pure Data has got several different versions. There's the vanilla version, that Miller Puckett maintains. There was a version called Pure Data Extended that included a lot more of the libraries that other people had made. Uh, that, unfortunately, is no longer supported, but uh, it was picked up and turned into Per Data, which has got a slightly more attractive GUI. It's got a few tweaks that make coding a little bit easier, uh, but it's essentially the same program. And this is the free version of Max MSP, which is the commercial package that is not identical, but it's very similar. If you've used one, you'd be able to use another. Patches are not completely compatible, unfortunately, but based on one, you can usually work out how to do something equivalent. Uh, other ones I'll mention briefly, VCV Rack, that's the emulation of modular synth architecture that we saw in the picture earlier and Touch Designer, which is largely designed for conventional video. It's something I've had to play with before, but I've not applied it to vectors uh, as yet. But it's sort of on my list of 
I wonder if this could do certain functionality that other software isn't uh, able to do. Uh, if you like programming in text form, then Chuck is the one that I'd, uh, I'd suggest. Processing, uh, we'll hear uh, Ted Davis talk about using that with the oscilloscopes again in another of the talks. And another option that may be appealing is Faust. Unfortunately, this is a very low-level language. Uh, and it's quite strange that it compiles into C++. Uh, but if you want, if you've got an application where you absolutely need the fastest possible, the most efficient possible processing, uh, then Faust is worth, uh, worth looking at. Uh, a few more examples, uh, like, a, again, a few colleagues, I tried doing some text generation uh, within pure data, and I'll, I'll show the examples of, of this. Let's just... Now, this, is, this one is rather crude. Which we have... You'll see the reflections off the screen. And there's a lot of ringing, but it jumps from one character to another. There's also not very good blanking. Uh, so in that, each individual character was drawn as a short, uh, a short selection of lines and it was rather a complicated process to do that. But I was able to say, right, you can play that at the, uh, the rate that's desired. But very crude results. And soon after that, I found there was an easier way using some laser software called LaserBoy. Now, this is also free and open source. It's got a very strange interface, very unconventional interface. But it was able to generate uh, WAV files corresponding to the uh, X, Y, and Z data that we needed. There's only nine, nine fonts available. There's also quite a lot of flickering because of the frequency it's trying to draw each, uh, each line with, and the longer words cause more flickering. There's always a bit of juggling the, between the different, uh, different frequencies involved. But this, as I say, it allowed nine possible, uh, nine possible fonts to be uh, made. Sorry, it's not a very exciting example. So, as I say, that was uh, that was certainly a possibility that allowed the at least the next. Uh, the next example, and since that was being generated again by in pure data by just simply playing through the WAV files, it allowed it to be combined with uh, with the main uh, performance software that I was using. So uh, again, I should probably apologise for the next example, uh, and can I be the very first person to wish you all a very merry Christmas? of the bezel of the ver the uh, vectrix.
Right, that's enough of that. Oh, and Happy New Year as well. Um, what this did demonstrate really was just a way of showing, yes, I can make several fonts and I can modulate their position according to the, uh, the pitch. There are other ways of, uh, of doing this, and Ted Davis will be talking about his XY Scope program that uh, uh, he's developed for processing, in fact, his library that he's developed for, uh, for processing. Uh, a few more examples I tried, and again, Ted Davis has done this rather better, so I'm a little bit embarrassed to mention some of these examples, but uh, I had a go at taking a raster video and trying to convert that to vectors. And to be honest, I didn't get particularly great results from it. It was a very long, intensive process of getting rid of as much information as I could uh, using a combination of uh, a program called uh, Potrace, Polygon Trace, and Laser Boy, and a C program, and Laser Boy again, and another C program, before eventually getting to uh, to some results. So again, I'll, I'll show the examples, and you can judge for yourself. This is a little clip from Grand Theft Auto. Essentially, there's too much information in each frame to render it, render it very well. I could optimize the algorithm a bit, but it would still have the same problems. My sound card is operating at 96 kilohertz, so the lowest I could really go was a frame rate of, I think this was 16, so that gives me 6,000 points in every frame and trying to get down to those 6,000 points. You can see it's got to make quite a few jumps that are a little bit too big, and uh, the results sadly speak for themselves. Uh, but it's recognizable, at least. We've got a lot of these, what were we calling them, love lines between the, uh, the different blobs that are being drawn, and these are quite hard to get rid of because we've got to jump from one position to another while things are blanked. But when you turn the brightness channel down to zero, it doesn't drop immediately to zero. There's going to be some time when the line is still visible, and that's the artifact that we, uh, that we saw before. Light? I, I stand corrected. <laughs> okay, right. For, for love lines, read uh, lines of, lines of, what was your term? Strings of light, that's the one. Okay. But yes, this is, this is a problem that, uh, is, is hard to get around because of there's, there's a 96 thousandth of a second potentially to go from full brightness to no brightness at all. And we could probably find a way of getting around that perhaps by, st instead of immediately moving to the next place, by stopping there, turning the brightness off, then moving, and then turning the brightness on, and then start moving at the new point. But this, of course, makes... Uh, makes the code more tricky, and it takes up some of the available points. Uh, the next example is was an attempt to do the same process, and I thought, I'll pick something a bit simpler than game footage. Uh, I'll pick this, this video that I made from black and white uh, music notation, and we've still got the same problem that it's not... Uh, it's not clear enough that we can reasonably interpret the notation that's, uh, uh, that's going on. The only advantage here is that these strings of light are now following the, bar, the uh, stave lines, so I sort of get away with it a little bit better than in the, uh, uh, in the previous example, but we've still got a few going on between uh, between the two staves. In the particular case of trying to show musical notation, there is another technique that 
would use other packages, one that I consider would be in score, but I, I'm sort of a bit reluctant to mention all these experiments I might do because I haven't actually done them, but maybe next year. Um, Semi-final night in Moscow as Croatia and England set out each to clear the I last reckon this would go down well before here. the World Cup final itself. Beautiful take from Jesse Lingard. Now Deli Ali has had his ankle tapped in position A1 for England. It is Kieran Trippier. It is delicious! Glorious, glorious England goal! Picture perfect! There is not a better strike than that. Ali. Lingard. Harry Kane! And Kane again! Lakitic for Vasalko, aimed in beyond to Mandzukic, and fired home by Perisic! <laughs> Croatia's cravings are satisfied, at least for now! And the semi-final is back where it began! And here is Perisic. Ivan Perisic has hit the post! And England breathe a collective and profound sigh of relief. Croatia won, England won. There will be half an hour more. Trippiers takes stones and off the line. Perisic. Aimed at Manchukic. What a save by Pickford. He was a brick wall. Pivoric. Walker got there. So though did Perisic. Manchukic. Croatia hit the front. Mario Manchukic pounced. And England are hurt. Croatia, for the first time ever, will play in a World Cup final. So, uh, hope you enjoyed that. Um, with that, that particular example, uh, that was the most recent, and that showed quite a few of the problems. Again, trying to get things down to 6,000 points per frame was very tricky, especially when there was a lot of detail in the crowd. You'll have noticed a lot of the crowd were flickering in and out because the algorithm tried to throw away the small objects in the frame, the things that were just a few vectors long, would sometimes see a person in the crowd was big enough, so it had to be rendered. And then the next frame, it just went under the threshold and it ignored that person entirely. And in fact, the, ones that gen the frames that generated the most vectors were of the goal nets, which were a nice, clear, sharp focus, but there was a lot of detail in every single hexagon in the goal nets. So, unfortunately, with this, I think I might sort of give up on that idea and try to follow Ted's approach of using processing, where a lot of the things I was using other software for are implemented in one of the uh, processing libraries. Uh, what's next? Uh, right, I'm going to mention a little bit about the synthesis algorithms and I'll say afterwards I'll uh, hopefully have some time to uh, show the performance package that I use. Uh, some of the different uh, techniques I, I've been trying to use. Again, I'll maybe just concentrate on the examples for reasons of time. Uh, but it's worth maybe mentioning a little bit more about the visualization aspects. Uh, where somebody else is responsible for the audio and the visual performer is trying to generate something to go along with that. Uh, it's useful to do a little bit of pre-processing of the signal before trying to interpret it. Of course, we can do an oscilloscope relatively straightforwardly. We can have an audio vector scope. Now, that's, if you like, an oscilloscope showing left against right, except the oscilloscope is rotated by 45 degrees. So if you've got a mono signal, you get a vertical line. If you've got a lot of stereo spread, it's spread out horizontally. And that's what the audio vector scope is traditionally used. Of course, you can show the FFT. You can also show the analytical signal where you delay the phase of one channel by 90 degrees compared to the other channel. And that gives you 
these sort of nice sort of cauliflower-like shapes. Uh, we can't do a real Hilbert transform. It's actually a fake Hilbert transform that happens to uh, look pretty much the same. Uh, I put these examples all into one, all into one video. So that's the uh, analytic signal. It works with this because it's a monophonic instrument. This isn't synchronized with the signal, so sometimes it'll appear fairly static. That's just repeated oscilloscopes. Interesting. You can't see, of course, the har individual harmonics, but it would need a bit of smoothing to, mo to look nicer. I was very surprised how nice this ended up looking. for that, for reasons of time. I was surprised this, that ended up looking so well, because you'd have thought a mono instrument, a single instrument would have been recorded in mono, but obviously they had some stereo mics. And whether or not they're identical, I don't know. But the trombonist must have been at least swaying a little bit side to side. Uh, so it's sort of exploiting the different directionality being picked up on the left and right. And that's why I say I, I was somewhat surprised that the results were uh, as interesting as that. Uh, the performance patch I'll, I'll show a little bit of shortly. I don't want to go into this in detail, but since I'd been a VJ before, I thought about what's the VJ signal flow, uh, starting with the very simplest VJ hardware mixer, the AV5. One source goes through an effect, another source goes through an effect, and then they get mixed. Uh, and then a very old version of the Resolume software package, three sources with an effect get blended together, three more effects on top of that. Uh, the signal flow I ended up with was this one shown up to six sources. I rarely use all of them, 
with an effect, blending, more effects, blending, and more effects. And we'll see that, we'll see that shortly. That's what, uh, that's what the patch uh, looks like. We've got the sources around the outside. The ones in this box here are the different visualizers. And here's the effects block, and that's being opened to, uh, to select the different effects on that. Uh, first bus. Uh, I'm not going to show this particular example, I think, just because it's very similar in style to the one that we, I showed before, before we started. Essentially, I was recording it, not just the camera output, but recording the vectors I was generating. And I recorded the audio, which was a bit distorted, but at least it allowed me to synchronize the video recording with the, because of its bad audio. I could synchronize that with a good version of the audio, get them aligned, and then pretend that was what had, uh, what had happened. Uh, what I found with Pure Data is it's great having this GUI, but it's quite a pain to start programming in that environment. Uh, it's very non-traditional programming style. I uh, also did some stuff with a uh, language called Chuck, not as actively developed as the other packages, but more similar to C coding and potentially quite, uh, quite powerful. Uh, right, some more examples. I tried using the Synthesis Toolkit, which is built into Chuck, and it's built into a lot of music software packages. Uh, it's a physical modeling library. No, I said I wasn't going to show that one. And this just tested one of the synthesis algorithms against another synthesis algorithm. Uh, some of them ended up looking quite nice, but a lot of them didn't. They just showed a variety of shapes that I might reuse in other uh, in other situations so this was not really an ex not really a sort of final result in itself it was more which of these might generate some useful, uh, some useful shapes? Uh, next one I'll show. Uh, there's going to be one of the talks mentioning the links with analog computers, and I grabbed some of the algorithms that are used on either this commercial machine on the left-hand side, or this sort of monster of a machine that was uh, hand-built by a guy in uh, a guy in England, and. Yes, some of these ended up looking looking reasonably interesting. Um. Incidentally, in probably most of these ones that are done with the Vectrex, you'll see these staple lines to the side of the uh, the thing that's being drawn, and these are the spot killer that's not being completely blanked properly, uh, and they're sort of the, just an artifact that I really can't get rid of without doing the little modification. Uh, some of these end up looking quite uh, looking quite pretty. The audio. This is a, one of the cases where the audio corresponding to these sounds rather hideous in most cases. So I decided to make this a. Uh, a silent example. Uh, but the fact that it can be expressed in usually three equations uh, and implemented just in a, a s small number of lines of code is you know, potentially, quite, uh, potentially quite appealing. And these usually have a few parameters that potentially could be controlled externally.
they aren't actually spinning around themselves. I'm artificially spinning them just to see if there's a, a nice angle that they, uh, they look prettiest from. As I've said, being chaotic equations, they they tend to not sound very uh, very pleasant. Um, I suppose summing up the, the two packages that I've really used, we can do much the same thing in both of these environments. The little bit of code and pure data at the top, this is simply drawing a circle. And this is exactly what the second piece of code in Chuck does. It draws exactly the same circle. And there's... I suppose in terms of the amount of programming required to do both of these, it's probably a little bit quicker in, uh, in pure data, but there's not a massive difference uh, between them. But I've listed a few of the possible uh, disadvantages of both of them, and maybe sort of summarizing my experience with software, as I said before, not having a lot of hardware controls uh, is the downside to using software, which is why it's useful to be able to use, uh, use hardware controllers and send MIDI or OSC. Uh, a few other ones that I said I'm not going to really talk about. OSCE Studio Processing, Max MSP, Axolotl Patcher, we'll hear talks on those. I touched briefly on some of the other packages. There's no hard and fast rules what can be used and can't be used as long as it can do three channels, of course. Uh, this is VCV rack. To me, it seems, well, potentially very powerful, but it wastes a lot of space. Here we've got, uh, we've got a filter here in this amount of screen space in pure data. It takes a lot more in rack, and I don't imagine it would be that easy to uh, get a more complex patch developed with this without ending up with the software version of Cable Salad. Um, so it does seem something worth maybe looking into, and it is a free package, which is, uh, of course, useful. Uh, touch Designer looks like this. Think Pure Data, uh, rotated 90 degrees. Um, you can, of course, zoom in and open all these modules and have find more modules and so on. Uh, I've done some, a little bit of work in it before, but uh, not vectors as yet. Uh, this is what a Faust looks like. And although some of it looks, uh, looks familiar, the actual bits of coding would happen in lines like this or like this, and it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't maybe appeal for people who are more used to a language such as C or uh, C++. So, very brief summary of some of the uh, some of the software involved. Um, remaining issues: we've got to somehow capture the device, put it onto a raster display of some description. We've got to consider. Things like the spot, co spot color, the graticule on it, the fact that we've got to somehow prevent light from getting to the camera from other sources and tweaking the cars and all sorts of other, uh, other factors. And we still, as again I've said, we need other hardware to get the best out of, uh, out of the packages. Now, that's just about all the video examples, but I will just briefly, I think I probably get a few minutes I can fire up the uh, fire up the appropriate package. I'll just mention very quickly, and you're more than welcome to uh, come and have a look at uh, at what I'm doing with this. I'll be which way 
Yes, I'll use. Let's just set. Set something. So here's our different sources. The uh, for each of the generators, we've got various uh, various parameters that can be used. That is a very boring, predictable. This is used generator until you start adding some uh, phase modulation, which is the uh, proper name for frequency modulation. They're not identical, but this is implementing uh, phase modulation. Uh, or we can have some amplitude modulation, adding uh, a phaser to the uh, the frequency, uh, sorry, to the, the amplitude. It was all sorts of patterns very easily and different, <coughs> excuse me, different oscillators give you uh, different results. Um, it's just a sort of random oscillator in pure data called drunk. Um, we've got the uh, the shapes courtesy of uh, Derek. Let's just flick through those. Uh, these are very useful in combination with other patterns. So, for example, if I was to add that one to uh, a Lissajou, uh figure and play around with the the frequency, we get all sorts of. Uh, all sorts of interesting results. We can also go to, again, courtesy of Derek, the various polygons that, uh, again, are very useful in combination with other, uh, with other patterns. So we can spin those around and potentially also add this to say, the oscilloscope signal or anything else. Uh, trochoids are sort of spirograph type patterns they're not so uh, not so fascinating uh, I'll just jump back to the, the interface so we've got these different sources coming in at the top uh, here's our units that morph between two things with the crossfader or multiplex between the two shapes and this one stamp it actually follows one of the patterns but draws the second pattern in its place. So I'll, I think, just demonstrate that very quickly. If I go back to uh, just drawing a single, uh, a single shape. Let's see if I want to show that. Ah, this is doing something. Slightly unexpected. Okay, so we've got a basic, uh, a basic shape being drawn, and I could, if I wanted, morph that into a heart shape. Well, I've got the channels wrong. I don't care about changing that at the moment. I could morph from one to another, but the other option with this stamp option is I'll draw that second pattern where the first pattern would be, and that I find is often quite uh, is often quite effective. Uh, and then the other thing that's the other thing that's possible in this is quite a variety of different effects can be applied to any of these buses or any of these combinations. So if I took the thing that I've just uh, I've just generated and said I want to uh, I want to apply a bit crusher to it, it simply reduces the resolution to however many points you wish to uh, do. And there's about 20 different effects that can be used. This is the most recent one I've been playing with uh, a lot. Sort of sampling and holding. Uh, not quite that, but very closely related to that. And lots of different possibilities. Uh, I think I won't show really many more examples of this because I'll be showing plenty of examples uh, indirectly in the uh, performance I'm doing tomorrow with uh, Lala, with uh, Herbus Lava tomorrow night. So I think that's probably just about it for me. I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you.